Hey everybody, uh, we're going to look at finding limits analytically. And before we do get to any specific examples, it'd be best if we looked at some basic limits and some properties of limits to help us in our work. Some basic limits up here, let B and C be real numbers and N is a positive integer. Okay. If you're asked to evaluate this analytically, you're simply going to insert C anywhere you see X, but there is no X, so our answer is going to in fact be just B okay, in this problem right here. But I want to think about it graphically. I want you just to imagine, if you will, that this is f of x. This is our function, and b, we were told, is a real number. So when you think about a function being a real number, a constant, let's just kind of um, make up a value here. Let's let b be um, 3. So let's go ahead and graph where b is 3, or f of x is 3. Let's graph the horizontal line. Okay. So what's the limit of... 3 as x approaches c. Well, let's, uh, let's decide that c is going to be negative 2. If I'm approaching negative 2 from the right and negative 2 from the left, what are my y values leveling off to? Well, on a constant function, it's always going to be that value or that real number. And in this case, it's 3, but remember, we started with the generic, so our 3 was our b. Okay, so this limit is, in fact, just b. Okay, well, let's look at this example right here. What's the limit of the function x as x approaches c? Easy enough. Evaluate the function at c. See if it's a nice number. It is. And we get c. Oh, my goodness. Um, a graphical approach, or look at this, would have us graph y equals f, or f of x equals x. y equals x. Okay, and so that would look something like this here. And so as x approaches c on this function, let's just make up a c value, and I'm going to say 3 in this case. As x approaches 3 from the left and 3 from the right, what are the y's um, leveling off to? Well, it would be the functional value, and the functional value indeed here is going to be the same thing as what uh, I'm approaching along the x-axis. So that's um, going to be c. And you, again, like I say, you just find it from a direct substitution method as well. Okay, so let's look at this last example. Um, again, just evaluating the limit analytically has us replace n for x, c, so the answer would be c raised to the n. And whatever that would give us as far as calculations are concerned. Okay, if you wanted to use a, an example graphically to help you understand this, um, let's consider uh, n being 3. And if n is 3, we're going to be graphing x cubed so I would graph something of this nature, f of x equals x cubed. Okay, so let's let x approach, say, 1. Uh, no, let's, let's have x approach, say, 2 from the left and the right. As I approach 2 from the left and I approach 2 from the right, okay, um, it's well behaved. Notice that the limit of the function is going to actually be the functional value. So what do we do? Well, we insert, okay, 2. For x, remember this is x cubed, so that's the function we've decided this to be, x cubed. Okay, so as x approaches 2, we're going to evaluate the function um, at 2, and so we get an answer of 8. And that's all this is saying right here, is that what we're doing with this specific example is we're plugging 2 in for x, we get 2 cubed. Well, no matter what c is, okay, we're going to take it to that specific n power. Um, and we're going to get that limit. So those are just some basic limits. All right, properties of limits, things that um, we are allowed to do when we're working with um, limits. Again, again, B and C are real numbers. N is a positive integer, and F and G are functions with limits. So let's consider that um, we have some particular function, F of X, and as X approaches C, some number C, um, the function is leveling off to some specific number L. And likewise, over here, with the um, g function, um, we're dealing with another function, the limit of g of x, as x approaches c, that same c here as over here. So perhaps these two graphs are maybe both on the same uh, coordinate plane, but this graph is actually leveling off at k. Okay, so if we're approaching the same c value on two different functions and we have two different limits, what are some things that we're allowed to do? All right, so the scalar multiple. Let's just multiply okay, by a, a real number. Okay, so let's look at that notation. Oh. 
the limit as x approaches c. Okay. And let's let b just be a real number, a scalar, if you will. Um, let's just say we have b times some function f of x. Okay, we have a scalar multiple property that says, you know what you can do? You can actually factor out the b, and we can multiply that scalar by the limit, the value of the limit here. So the limit of a scalar times a function is equal to the scalar times the limit of the function. So let's kind of use these ideas up here to help us finish this. Okay, well I have b, and I'm going to multiply b times, what is this actually equal to as what was given up here? Well, that was given to us as the number l. So our answer in this um, situation would be b times l. So if we know the value of the limit, we can just simply multiply it by b. We don't have to take and multiply the function and make the numbers larger by multiplying by b, um, if b was greater than 1. Um, so in this case, we could actually try and simplify our work and maybe take a factor out and, and deal with this uh, on a more easy basis and then multiply, go back and multiply by b at the end. Okay, let's consider that um, we have two functions and we're adding them together, an f and a g function. Okay, the limit of a sum, or in this case, it could be a difference, so I'm not going to say both are happening, I'm just going to say it's one or the other, but the limit of the sum of two functions is actually equal to the sum of the individual limits. And to finish this here, uh, we could go back and insert, okay, the value for this limit, which is L, and then the value of this limit right here is K. So depending upon what operation you're working with, um, you can perform the necessary calculations and have the limit. So again, the limit of the sum or difference um, of two functions is equal to the sum or, or difference of the limit of the individual functions. Okay, Let's look at product property. Um, let's say that we are multiplying indeed two functions together. So the limit of a product is equal to the product of a of the limits. So the limit of a product is equal to the product of the limits. So again, we're replacing this whole expression right here with L, and this expression right here with K, we can say that the answer is LK. So, you know, and when you think about what this is doing for us, it might be easier if you think about it in the future when we're asked to evaluate limits, instead of multiplying two expressions together, for example, if F of X was maybe a binomial, and G of X was maybe a trinomial, instead of doing all that necessary algebra and multiplying these together, Perhaps it would be better if we evaluated the function, the binomial at C, evaluated G, the trinomial at C, and then just took those numbers and multiplied them together. So I guess it'll determine the context will determine what what approach we take, and what, which which you know which side of this property we'd want to involve. Okay, as the word implies in the next property, the quotient. So the limit of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the individual limits. So who wants to do polynomial long division if they don't have to? Well, not me. 
Okay, so right here, instead of dividing out two variable expressions, maybe long division would be necessary. Okay, perhaps it would be just as easy to evaluate um, f uh, and find the limit of f as x approaches c and find the limit of g as x approaches c and just take those numbers and di divide them. Divide them. So here, L divided by K. And uh, one last property, the power property, and then we're able to get to our examples. Control Z that hopefully. Oh no, that's not. Oh yeah, that took it away. There we go. Uh, okay. So the limit of a power is going to be equal to the power okay, of a limit. So we do have a property that allows us to evaluate the limit. First, find that limit. You notice the grouping symbols here. In this, in this uh, side of the equation, we're asked to actually take f of x and raise it to some power. For example, if this was x plus 2 and I had to raise it to the 10th power, I am not going to multiply quantity x plus 2 times itself 10 times. Oh my. Okay, so instead, if we wanted to simplify our work, what we can do is say, okay, well, let me evaluate x plus 2 at this c value, get that number, and then take and raise it to whatever the power is that we're working with. So it's a little bit easier. So maybe you can see where this is going then. So this would be the value of the limit, which would be L in this case. I could have picked on G up here. I just decided to pick on F more often. Okay, I can evaluate this simple limit first and then take it to the power bin. Okay, so those are our properties. As you guys can see from this worksheet right here that um, we're going to begin our examples using these ideas up here, um, down here. So we'll have to do that in the next video. See you then.